right. Good afternoon. Seems like quite a number of you have already taken off for the beach or something like that. Anyhow, good. So uh, let's see a couple of things. Um, uh, number one, next Friday uh, we're going to have a faculty retreat. Um, we have this kind of once a year, all the faculty disappear from campus and talk about very important things. At least that's what I think. Uh, so um, trying to figure out what to, the best thing is to do, I, there's two options. I can move the lecture till the week after and have a makeup lecture on Tuesday. Or I could have one of the TAs teach it. So I'm not kind of uh, questioning what the best thing to do is. Uh, it's getting pretty jammed uh, overall. Or I might move it to next Tuesday. Uh, that's the other option. So any preferences? Keep it on the slot where it is and have one of the TAs teach it or move it to next Tuesday or the Tuesday after. I'm afraid that if you move it to the Tuesday after, we're going to have basically the poster sessions on Wednesday. That seems to be very tight. That seems not to be not such a good idea. So maybe I'll try to see if I can do something on next Tuesday. So we would have lecture Tuesday, Wednesday. Try to move it somewhere later in the afternoon. That seems to be the best thing to do. And then you're going to have uh, a long time to work on the project. <laughs> uh, talk about the project. Um, I've looked at all the uh, project reports so far. It looks very good. Uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to get you by Monday. Each group will get an email with some individual feedback. Like, right on, keep moving forward, or maybe you can be a little bit more aggressive here or there, or something like that. So we'll give you some feedback. The grading itself uh, will probably get you on Wednesday. I want to talk to uh, on Wednesday in class. I'm going to call, walk to a couple of projects and show you what the type of things is that you have to watch out for. But obviously, since it's work in progress, I'm not planning to, to show everybody what that everybody else is doing. That's obviously our individual work. But um, I've seen some very good projects already. I think that people figure out that, yes, you can make this thing a lot faster. And yes, you can reduce the energy quite substantially. I um, think, however, um, I think there's some people who kind of focus primarily on the adder structure. That's good. But as I mentioned already a couple of times before, be a little bit more aggressive. Think about the overall topology. Mess around a little bit with it. Move things around a bit because that's where the biggest gains are. Okay? So just don't say, well, gee, I'm going to change my other cell. That's going to help it. Yes, it helps a bit, but it's not going to be where you're going to get the big gains. Okay? So for, expect by Monday an email in your email box kind of just saying, hey, this is good, write on, or Maybe you should look at this, or actually, I'm not sure that this is really right type of thing, so that you can keep on moving. So individual feedback is what we're going to do at this phase. I said at this point in time, so this is an interim report. Uh, we're going to grade it quite easily. It's going to be on five points, and we're just going to give you, um, most of you who are really on the right direction are going to get a five on five. If there's something wrong or there's some lacking things, it might be a little bit less than that. OK? So that's the project. So for those of you who just got in, um, there's going to be no lecture next for Wednesday, next Friday, but it's going to be a lecture, makeup lecture on Tuesday afternoon. Okay, and then we have so that's next week, so Tuesday, Wednesday lecture, and then uh, uh, the week after, there's only two things left. Wednesday, we're going to have a whole afternoon of poster sessions, no lecture, and the poster sessions will be at the Wireless Research Center over in downtown Berkeley. Um, everybody's going to make a proposal. We'll tell you how to make posters and things like that. But it's going to be a whole afternoon. You sign up for a certain slot, and then the TAs and myself are going to walk around and chat to each of you of uh, what you've done. And then there's going to be a final lecture on Friday where I plan to um, just chat a little bit about what's going on in the semiconductor world. Uh, some future directions, exciting things that are going on, kind of giving you more appetite to learn more about digital circuits after 141. Okay? I'm afraid that given the pace we're going, we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about memories. So uh, that's a topic I'm going to go very lightly on this year. Might not even touch it at all, because I believe it's better to kind of touch the topics we're doing right now, like wires, uh, clock distribution,
power uh, management. And then I'll give you kind of a brief intro in the world of memory design. Okay? Good. Uh, any questions? Remarks? Concerns? Alrighty. You, you guys are easy. Uh, good. So let's go to uh, wires. So last lecture I talked to you about wire capacitance. The wire capacitance uh, used to be simple, pure power plate capacitance, but today this has extended in a variety of directions. Wires have become these vertical things instead of horizontal things sitting above a dielectric. So the power plate capacitance is only a small fraction of it. You will have fringing cap and also more importantly so and so is wire to wire capacitance. Capacitance between the sides of the wires becomes quite important. And you have to take that into account. Uh, so that's um, regarding wire uh, capacitance. Now, that would be good if it's only that, but wires have some other parasitic elements as well, especially resistance and inductance. And today, that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, resistance of wires, how resistance evolves over time, and how to deal with it from a modeling perspective. And then I would like to talk a little bit about inductance, um, something I think you don't see very often in our classes. You see it probably se physics 7b, you learn something about inductance, and maybe a little bit in 40, and then kind of suddenly the inductors disappear, unless you do big machines. But I don't think so many, many of you have taken power electronics. Uh, so inductors is something that kind of didn't, was an integrated circuit was not that important, but it's getting more and more important every day. So let's first think about wire resistance. So again, your wire is a structure which is aluminum, copper, whatever you want to have. Uh, it's a rectangular type structure. Your current flows in a certain direction. And the wire has a length L, a height H, and a width W. Now, if I want to compute the resistance of a wire of a length L for the current flowing along those lines, we know that the resistance is going to be proportional to the res resistivity of the material. Now, you can imagine that the longer the wire gets, the more resistance you're going to get. So it's going to be proportional to the length L. And at the same time, we can imagine that if I make the cross-section of my wire thinner, I'm going to increase resistance, uh, resistance as well. So actually, resistance is reversely proportional to this W times H, which is the cross-section of the wire. Okay. Now, you as a designer cannot choose the resistivity. Right? That's something your friends in the fab are giving you. They're saying, here you have copper, aluminum, titanium, whatever they come up with. Okay. So resistivity is given. The height of the wire is also something you cannot choose. That's also a process parameter. So H is another process parameter. So rho and H is something that's a given factor, so we don't want to deal with it. They say, okay, let's lump those two together into one factor, which we call the sheet resistance of the material. And um, very often people draw, the symbol they use for it is this. R with a little square as an index. That's the sheet resistance of a given material. It could be aluminum, could be copper, could be polysilicon, anything like that. Now, it's interesting. If I now want to compute the resistance of a wire, I multiply the sheet resistance with length L and divide it by the, um, the factor, the width of the wire W, because that's also something I can choose. Uh, I can make a wire wider and wider and wider. Now, why do we call this the sheet resistance? Well, actually, it's interesting. Think about it, if I have L equal to W, they cancel out of each other. So it means that if I have a square of material and have current flowing to this square, the resistivity is totally going to be independent of the size of that square. I make this really big square, really tiny square, it's always going to be R sheet, this R square. Okay. So um, to figure out what the resistivity is, you really have to figure out how many squares you get. Right? And, you basically, so, and that's given by this L over W ratio. 
Okay, so that's a good property to remember. R square is really that's what you're going to get from the fab. They're going to give you the sheet resistance of different materials. You don't even have to worry how thick that wire really is, because you cannot do anything in it, about it anyhow. So to to look at resistance, uh, here you have the resistivity of a variety of materials. So tungsten is okay, 5.5, but not very good. Aluminum is a little bit better. And as I said, we used to, uh, most chips in, until about five years ago, were using aluminum almost uniquely. Okay. Uh, we also can do wires in polysilicon, by the way. Dope polysilicon is also a conductor. We use it for the gate material. The gate of a transistor typically is polysilicon as a conductor. Uh, polysilicon is worse than this. Polysilicon would be sitting somewhere up here in terms of sheet resistance. So it's not something I'm going to use for long wire. Obviously, if you have long wires, you would like to have the material with the lowest resistivity. Okay, so aluminum is good. Gold, very nice as well. So people are using gold on uh, some of the high-performance chips, um, like uh, very often RF chips, where you have signals that are coming in with very high frequencies. People like to use gold. Don't think it's a lot of gold. They don't try to basically get one of your chips and scrape it off. It's not going to get you a lot of money. But uh, gold is, as is, is, is you see, it's about, you know, about 20%, 10% better than aluminum. Copper is, again, a lot better uh, than that. Uh, copper, that's why copper is a very attractive material. It's, about, it's almost half, not as much, but almost half of the resistivity of aluminum, which means from a delay perspective, that can basically make a big difference. And as I mentioned last class, silver is even better. That's the best one that's out there. But the problem is silver is a nasty material. It, it doesn't really go very well with silicon. So I haven't seen anybody even trying to use silver as an interconnect material. So copper is the material of choice today. OK. Let's do some scaling analysis. That's always important. Um, we say, um, look at trends. Uh, what's happening if we scale down technologies? What's going to happen with, we've, we talked about capacitance. We've shown what's happening. For instance, if I take a capacitor and I scale everything down, uh, our capacitance has gone linearly with the technology, just like your inverted propagation delay, which is nice. Your load scales as delay. Wonderful. Now let's look at the wire. Okay, we know the equation that the resistance of the wire is Resistivity by W times H. Now, let's not assume that we would scale the wire. Uh, it, it, the change of the wire in exactly the same way. Okay, so we scale the cross section as S squared, obviously as in one direction, as in the other direction, as X squared, and we also make the length of the wire shorter. Okay, what do I get if I look at the overall resistivity? We see actually that the resistivity goes up with a factor S. It increases. The length goes down, but my cross section basically goes up, uh, basically is reduced by a factor S squared. And as a result of that, my resistivity of my wire is going to go up. Okay? Um, so that's not good. Think about it now. If I would say, what's going to be the delay of a wire? approximately like this. Delay of a wire is somewhere roughly the product of the resistance times the capacitance, right? Um, I will come back in more detail. But if I multiply the resistance, with the, cap the capacitance goes down as 1 over S. The resistor goes back up as with a factor S. So the net effect is that the delay of the wire is a constant. So we scale technology. Gates get faster with a factor 1 over S while the delay of the wire is constant, which means that the delay of the wires becomes more and more important from generation to generation. Okay? Now, this is assuming that my wire length L scales as the technology. Now, remember that the histogram I plotted last class, where I basically plotted the length of the wires on a chip as a function of number of wires. And we saw that there's a bunch of wires here that are kind of short. These are local wires. These are the wires that I'm using to connect NAND gate to NOR gate within, let's say, your ELU. 
obviously you might expect when the when you scale down the gates the size of the gates you expect that the wire lengths between those things are going to get shorter too these are called local wires this is why we call this local wire scaling the length of the wires is going to scale like the technology but that's not true for all the wires those wires here those long wires scale not as the technology but as the size of the chip so if I make my chip larger and larger and larger over time my longer wires tend to get longer and there the scaling scenario is, is even worse because there let's say we look at global wiring let's say now that uh, my wire length stays constant we say okay the chip size remains approximately the same so L is constant so what we see now is that uh, L is a constant WH basically has gone down quadratically my wire resistance goes up quadratically wire resistance goes up quadratically capacitance scales linearly down which means my delay is going up linearly gate delay going down wire delay going up that's not a pretty picture so what have our friend the technologists done about this they say that that's really bad right that's not something I really like so what can I do well what they've decided to do is well if I would scale my wires but rather than scaling both W and H I'm going to keep H a constant right so I scale from technology technology node well I'm, I'm just going to scale the width of the wire I have to because I have more transistors their pitch is getting smaller so I have to keep on scaling the width of the wires but the thickness of the wire I can basically make constant so if I do that we basically get the following scenario now oh well this is the full scaling we already discussed that gate delay speed up by the factor s we already said that so this is constant this is scenario one everything scales we discussed that so suppose now I take a local wire first I take a local wire I scale W I scale L both of them with the factor W over S and I also scale the thickness of the oxide obviously so what's happening with the resistance in that case? Uh, if you look at the resistance, where it used to go up with a factor S, remember? When you have a local wire, you scale it, capacitor goes down the factor S, resistance goes up with a factor S. But by keeping the thickness of the wire constant, the wire gets shorter and it's getting a little bit thinner. Right? I basically scale down the width of the wire with a factor S. Those two cancel out resistivity is a constant capacitance goes down linearly so we get our factor one over s wire scaling so it's quite nice right from a local wire perspective this is beautiful gates are getting faster with a factor of s wires get faster with a factor one over s so they scale identically which is nice and this is the way we have been scaling local wires for quite a while long time now but obviously you're going to have some limits at some point in time you cannot have wires that are kind of like this right that would be pretty tricky to basically design those things and at some point in time we're in trouble so this is our limitation on how far you can keep on stretching this at some point in time you have to scale the height of the wire a little bit as well for global wires um now uh, before we go that let's look at what's happening when i do that as i already mentioned before uh, if you now do a little trick here, I keep the, the height of the wires the same. I scale the length of the wire linearly and I scale the width of the wire linearly. Local wire again. Now what's happening while I'm basically scaling down the width of the wire, obviously I'm also going to scale down the pitch between the wires, the distance between the wires, right? I have to again because I get so many more transistors that I have to connect to each other. I need more wires, so I'm going to make my wires move closer and closer. So the height remain constant, and I move them closer. What's going to happen is that this interwire capacitance starts to increase. Okay, this and interwire. This is the side capacitance of your wire is remaining actually a constant because this is um, the wire gets shorter, but at the same time the distance between the wires basically gets reduced. So that cancels out. CPP remain constant. 
That's why it is interwire effects are becoming more and more important. I move my, I don't really change the height of the wires, but I move them closer and closer to each other. It fastens basically, uh, even if I scale down the length of the wire, capacity is constant. Now why do I worry about this thing? Well, remember the picture I shared the last time, this victim wires, that if one wire sits there and the other guy, my guy goes up and the other one goes up as well, it fights the changes in my wire. You have coupling interference between neighboring signals. And that hurts, creates noise, and so on and so forth. So, and as I said, eventually we're gonna have to scale the height of the wire. Uh, uh, this is uh, something we cannot keep on doing. So that's why at some point in time, aluminum didn't do it anymore. And people thought very, very, very hard on other materials. But it was tough. Because as I mentioned before, a copper is a good material, but if I would just take silicon and I put copper on, on top of it, what's gonna happen is that this, those copper ions are gonna start diffusing into the silicon. And they destroy the semiconductor pr uh, properties of your silicon material, becomes a mess. Actually, if you look at a, you go into a fab, a very modern fab, let's say, if you ever get a chance, yeah, to visit one of those fabs like Intel or whatever, go in there, get in the bunny suit and kind of wander around. Uh, what you see is that the copper section, where they do the copper thing, is gonna be in a completely different section of the fab. It's gonna be in a totally isolated space because they're really afraid of that copper getting into the process somewhere. So you try to keep separation as much as possible between those materials. So how do they solve it? Well. It was very clever, it was uh, IBM who invented this thing. They say, you know, you wanna do copper type of connectivity, what you're gonna do is you're gonna clad the wire. So you have a copper wire. Uh, what you're gonna do is surround it with some intermediate material. So anytime, let's say I wanna get a wire, you're gonna etch out a hole, fill it up with some intermediate material, and then you fill it up with copper. So you have an intermediate material between the silicon and the copper keeping them apart. It's all, that's also conductor. Uh, that intermediate material obviously has to conduct, uh, but as you can see, it acts as an intermediate one. It's gonna increase the resistivity a little bit because this material is not as gonna be as good as copper in terms of resistivity. This is called the Damaskine process. Uh, as I said, invented by IBM, now used by every company, okay? So the global wire scaling thing, yeah, same story. We basically can, we know that wire delay S squared and gain some. So global wires are really where we have the problem. Now, one way to get around that is to say, well, gee, for local wires, ones that basically connect gates, you have to be able to connect two gates and a very short, you don't wanna um, have many, many contact layers between them. Typically, con connections between neighboring gates, I would like to do in metal one, metal two, or metal three. And we know that those local wires scale, so it doesn't matter that much, I can make those wires thinner and thinner. Right, they scale nicely. The global wires are the ones where we're worried about. This is where we see that if we would scale those wires, the delay would go up quite substantially. So what technologists have done is say, well, you know, there's a fairly simple solution to that. Uh, let me before, let me just go to that first. So here's an example. This is uh, a metal stack. This is um, an IBM picture. This is copper interconnect. And what they did is it's like a metal structure and then they etch away all the dielectric material. So the only thing you have left is the copper wires. You can see this really look like a Manhattan-like structure, freeways on top of each other, over crossings, under crossings, all those kind of things. But the most important thing to remember is that if you look at them, this is an Intel, 25 micron, 20, 250 nanometer process. What you see is the, they did the following thing. At the bottom level, this is metal one, right here. You get fairly skinny wires. Wires that are not very thick and that allow to be fairly thin as well in terms of the width. And that's good because those are the ones that are gonna connect our gates together. And since they're not very long, the length of those wires is gonna scale, it's okay for us to actually scale all the dimensions and the cross sections. Um, so those wires, at, so we have basically three or four layers of skinny wires. 
And then what you can see if you go higher up in the metal stack, you see that wires get thicker, like here and here and here. Gradually, we're going to require the wires to stay further away from each other, and we're going to increase the thickness and the minimum width. So those are really fat wires. And those are the ones we're going to use for long interconnections. Because, you know, the answer to basically scaling the problem of scaling the cross-section is that increased resistivity. The answer is very simple. Don't scale it. Keep it the same. So you will see that if you go from, let's say, 250 nanometers, 130 nanometers, 90, 65, and you look at the middle stack, the sizes of the wires on the top of the stack haven't changed at all over all those generations. They always have remained the same pitch, the same thickness, and so on and so forth. And those are the ones you're going to use for those long wires. Those are the ones you're going to use for your clock distribution. Those are the ones you're going to use for your power distribution. Low resistivity wires. This is a five letter metal layer process. This is a 90 nanometer process. I mean, you can count how many layers in there. But you see, gradually, we get from thinner wires to thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker, and thicker, thicker structures. And the same thing is true, by the way, also about the VIAs. Because VIAs are the connections that basically connect one layer to the next layer. What it really is, it's a hole in the dielectric that we fill up with metal. Right? So obviously, the resistivity of those VIAs is important as well. So at the top layer, you're going to have big VIAs. And at lower levels, you're going to have smaller and smaller holes. Okay? So that's modern interconnect. Many layers, 9 to 10 layers. And you have to be very careful on how you use those different layers. Uh, it doesn't make sense, let's say, if an NAND gate here and another NAND gate just next to it to say, well, gee, I'm going to connect on level 9. It means it's like you have to take an elevator first to level 9. And you get up there, you make your connection, then you have to take the elevator down again to nine floors of interconnect. You don't want to do that. So your standard cell is typically going to have, let's say, two. Within the standard cells, you might use two to three layers of metal. That's max. And all the other layers on top of that are going to be used to connect the cells together or do the clock distribution, or the power distribution. Okay? So that's one thing we have done, and that's very typical. Um, there's some other problems. Um, as I mentioned, um, silicon, um, uh, the, the gate material, for a long time, of, um, and every process you're doing, 65 nanometers, the gate material you are going to use to implement the connection to the gate is always polysilicon, doped polysilicon, not undoped, doped polysilicon, either P plus or M plus. Okay? Now, polysilicon, as I mentioned before, doesn't have a very good resistivity either. It's a factor about 10 to 100 worse than uh, aluminum or copper. So you don't want to run for a long distance with those things. Now, suppose now that I uh, take, let's say, a gate. I have my transistor gate here, and you have your wire coming in. Uh, if I put this, this wire gets a certain length, polysilicon, that's adding quite a bit of resistance. Now, you can imagine, if I now look at this from a schematics perspective, you would have uh, the next gate sitting here, and if I use polysilicon, this polysilicon is going to add resistivity here. So. Having a highly resistive gate would not be very nice because I add extra propagation delay in driving the gate. It's going to reduce the slopes that I'm going to get because I have to, this capacitor here now has to be charged to that large resistor. So one thing that people have come up with to basically get around this problem is saying, well, gee, we're going to keep polysilicon as a gate material because we really like polysilicon. Polysilicon and silicon dioxide are perfect matches to each other. Uh, when you put the two on top of each other, they bound very nicely, and there's not much mess going on on the interface between the two. There's some, where we get some trapped charges and things like that that might change the VT, but not very much. So they bond very nicely to each other, perfect infer interface material. Um, but on the other hand, the problem is polysilicon has high resistivity. So the solution that technologists have come up with is using the sandwich approach. Um, I say, well, you know, Polysilicon is bad, but we're going to do on top of the polysilicon, we'll put yet another layer, um, which is a silicide. It's silicon which is doped heavily, or basically it's a combination of silicon and some metal, metal type of molecules. 
It's either wolfram silicide, titanium silicide, platinum silicide, or titanium silicide. So it's a material, it's a siliciding material that has a much better resistivity, about a factor 10 better than polysilicon. And if you have a sandwich of two of those materials together, it's like two resistors in parallel, right? And the smaller the resistor of the total parallel connection is going to be somewhat smaller than the smallest resistor, right? So you get the resistivity of the silicide, so the current flows through the top layer, and then for the gate control, um, you only really have that particular patch of material here for basically to contend with. And you still get the very nice connectivity between polysilicon and silicon dioxide. So silicides are the preferred methodology, and you will see in your 65 nanometer process, we're going to use silicides. Not only for the gate, but actually, gee, since we have silicides, anyhow, we're also going to put some silicide on top of the source and the drain, reducing the source and drain resistance as well. Because this thing, N plus, is also a pretty lousy conductor. It's a conductor, but not a very good one. So putting some silicide on top of that reduces the RS and the RD, the series resistance in, uh, for the source and the drain. Now, now, you might have heard that starting at 45 nanometers, life is changing. Uh, you, you know what has changed at 45 nanometers? At least in one company. If you know by the latest microprocessor from Intel, you're not going to see this anymore. Actually, at 45 nanometers, uh, Intel has switched back to a technology which is called metal gate. Actually, the earliest transistors we ever built didn't use polysilicon. The MOSFETs in the 70s were metal gate devices. Metal, silicon dioxide, and then basically your channel below that. Intel has moved back to metal gates. Um, and at the same time, they have changed the material here, this, pol this silicon dioxide, they got rid of that too. Uh, and replaced it by a new dielectric, which is called a high K dielectric. The problem with scaling, and uh, we have briefly mentioned the problem of gate leakage before. I scale down dimensions, dimensions, I get them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. At some point in time, you just have a couple of molecules. Your, your thickness of your gate dielectric is just a couple of molecules. And electrons happily tunnel back and forth between that thin layer. So you get gate leakage. Uh, the only way to get through gate leakage is either keep your gate very thick, but we don't like that because it does basically create a lousy transistor. Remember, your current is proportional to the C-ox. And the larger we can make C-ox, the better for our current drive over device. So we don't like to keep it thin. So the only way to basically allow us to still kind of thin the gate or get the same effect is basically using a material with a better uh, top of, a bit of higher value of epsilon because C is equal to epsilon ox over T ox. So I get a better epsilon ox or material with a better epsilon, I can keep the gate, th gate thickness the same and still increase the capacitance. So high K, uh, dielectrics help us to keep on scaling the device without running into the gate leakage problem. The problem with those high K devices is that they don't work very well with, with polysilicon as a material, so that's why we're switching back to metal. So 45 nanometers, Intel really made the switch. Metal on top, high K dielectric, and then your gate structure. Now, last week, IBM and uh, IBM Club as they call it, a club of people who like IBM. Uh, they decided that starting at 32 nanometers, they're also going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to be a high K metal gate type of connectivity. OK? So there's some things that people are playing around with here to basically make sure. Uh, obviously, when we have a metal gate, resistivity of the gate material, of the connectivity into the gate, is going to go down as well, which is kind of nice. Okay, so just to get an idea of the sheet resistance, uh, copper uh, is not even on this table here. So N-well diffusion, N plus P plus, has a resistivity of about 50 to 150 ohm per square. If you add silicides on top of it, as we mentioned, reduces it with a factor of 10 approximately. N plus P plus, you can see that silicon is not a very good conductor. 
but you add silicides to it, again, I can reduce it quite substantially. But even then, I'm far worse than aluminum. And copper basically gives another factor, two to three, on top of that. Okay? So that's interesting to know because resistivity is going to be an important factor. Okay. Seen that? Seen that. Now, let's now think a little about what's going to happen if I have to start taking resistivity into account. So far in our class here, we have considered all our designs we've done in your project, you assume that wires are basically capacitors, right? That's what we have assumed. A wire presents a certain amount of capacitance. That's a load for the device that has to drive it. But in reality now, it becomes a resistive element. So if you have pure capacitance, you know, what you get is a, a wire that becomes like this. If the resistivity is very small, you can consume this bunch of capacitor, you can lump it all together and say, okay, I have one lumped resistor that I have to add basically to my load of my driver. Okay? But in reality, the answer is going to be more like this. I have all those little resistors. The wire itself, between your capacitance and your wire basically is a distributed collection of resistors and distributed capacitance. So in reality, a wire looks more like something like this. So you have a stretch of wire, and I can approximate it as tiny little resistors followed by tiny little capacitors. Resistor, capacitor, resistor, capacitor, resistor, capacitor. That's kind of one way of modeling a wire with resistivity. You break it up into segments, small segments of length dx, and each segment has a resistance r times dx, and where r is the resistance per unit length, and you have a capacitance C times the X, where C is the capacitance per unit length. Okay? So, now, if this is happening, if you have this distributed RC delay line, what's going to be the delay over that wire? That's the question we, ask, we should ask ourselves, right? Um, and first, first shot would be, could be so, well, yeah, I have resistors, I have capacitance. What can we do is just lump all the resistance into one resistor and put all the capacitors together in one large capacitance. Right, that's a nice model. That could be a possible model of this wire here. You lump all the capacitors over the length of the wire and you say, okay, my, my capacitance is going to be C times L, where L is the length of the wire, and my resistance is going to be R times L. Okay? Now, that's one possibility. Turns out that when you do so, you're going to be very pessimistic. Actually, the reality is better than this. Um, because if you start taking it apart, let's, you can write down the equations for this, right? Um, you know how to do this, and I can basically have a wire like this. I can write down Kirchhoff's law and every one of those nodes in this network. Get them up. This is V1, V2, V3, V4, and so on and so forth. Write down Kirchhoff's law in these things and combine it all and you get a nice set of the equations. And you solve it. Shouldn't be too hard. It's just an end order differential equation. Um, tractable. Actually, not really tractable. Because this is the equation you ultimately get. If I write down the, the Kirchhoff's law in any one of those points, I get this equation that I see is going to be CL times dV dt. It's the voltage from this left side to the right side divided by R per start dl. If I get dx to go to zero, which in reality you should do, right? Then you, uh, the perfect answer is when you basically get all those small segments to go to zero. What you get is this equation here. Now, uh, it says that RC, which is the time constant of the network, is the resistance per unit length times the capacity times dv dt is equal to the squared, the, the second order derivative of v with respect to x, where x is, is the position on the wire. So x is 0 at the beginning of the wire, x is equal to L at the end of the wire. Now, has any one of you seen an equation like this before? This equation, it doesn't it look familiar. What? Sorry? It's not a wave equation. It's uh, very close. Think about 130. Who has taken 130? Yes, so... You probably learned, 
don't doesn't ring a bell anywhere. Here about if I take P and N material and I put them together. Right? Two materials that I put them together. What's happening? Yes, it's diode. But what's happening with the diode? What's the mechanism? Diffusion. Diffusion? This is the diffusion equation. It basically is exactly the same form as the diffusion equation that you will see when you analyze semiconductor material. Okay? So it's an equation which is well known and it's solvable. So, um, by the way, we can define an intermediate constant, this tau. Tau is going to be equal, let's define it as L squared times RC over 2. We'll come back to that later. So, here we go, same thing, diffusion equation. This is exactly the same as I was just writing. There we go, diffusion equation. It wasn't there, just two slides for it. Now, what's the difference between a lump model and a diffusion type model? Remember, if I would lump my resistor and my capacitor together into one element, what does a transient response look like? Right, it's a first order differential equation and we know that we're gonna get something like 1 minus e to the power t over tau, right, that is asymptotically. It's v times 1 minus e to the power t over tau. That's the way the transient looks like, where tau is a time constant, which is equal to r times c. So you get uh, something of that nature, bingo. For one single time constant, the derivative here or the slope of this is equal to tau, and it goes asymptotically to the final value, okay? Now, what do you see if I now take a wire, a long wire, which is RC, and I apply a step at the input? What's happening if I look at different points over time, right? So this is time, this is voltage. If I look at the beginning of the wire, like L over 10, this looks pretty much like the same thing, right? It is like uh, a, a waveform that basically is asymptotic exponential. But the further I go down, let's say if I look at the length of the wire, you see that initially nothing happens. It stays flat, and then finally you can start seeing a slope going upwards. So a very different behavior than what you would see with your asymptotic behavior. Okay? So important thing to remember that the waveform, because now I have a whole bunch of time constants, right? It's a very distributed time constant type of perspective. But you can see, you apply your step, and you now see this step diffusing along the wire. That's why it's a diffusion equation. It's just like your, if I would have P and N, and it's the way the holes will basically diffuse into the end material, for instance. Okay? Same deal. So, what does that do to propagation delay? That's my worry, right? That's the only thing I really care about. All the rest is, what's the 50% point at the end, approximately? Okay, let's do some little exercise. Um, let's come back to my good old friend, Elmore. Uh, we've heard about Elmore a couple of times. Elmore delay, remember what he said is, yeah, there's a very complex set of RC delays, a lot of time constants, but actually there's a very good approximation for a RC network. Right, if you look at this network here, you have resistor, capacitor, resistor, capacitor, resistor, capacitor. What the Elmore delay says is that uh, the Elmore time constant, which is a decent approximation of the time, dominant time constant of this network, is where you take, you take every capacitor in the chain and you multiply it with the resistance between the source and that capacitor. And you add, do this for every capacitor and you add them together. Right, that's the Elmore delay. So I take capacitor C1, so my Elmore time constant tau is going to be equal to C1 times R1. If you look at C2, between C2 and the source we have R1 and R2. So we add C2, R1 plus R2. And then you look at the C3, C3 gets R1 plus R2 plus R3. Okay. That's the Elmore delay approximation we have discussed before. The other of the option, you can turn it around too. I say I take every resistor in the chain here, and I multiply it with every capacitance that's downstream. So R1, CC1, C2, and C3, so I can write down R1, 
C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus R2, C2 plus C3 plus R3 times C3. Same thing. If you look at it, it's totally equivalent. Okay? That's the way we find it. Um, for every capacitor, draw the path of the current from that capacitor to the input and multiply the capacitor by the sum of R's on the current path that are common between V in and V out. And add them all together. Okay? So this is very easy for a chain. Like a wire is a chain, right? It's a, there's no branches in a wire, per se. At least not in the wires we have seen so far. So, that's the answer of this problem I just showed you. I worked it out. It's very straightforward. Now, what I could do is take my long wire, and let's use Elmore delay equation to figure out the delay of that long wire. So what I'm going to do is take a wire and I'm going to divide it in little segments and say this is going to be, all of each is going to be L over N. Okay, I, I divide my wire in chunks of N values. Okay. And obviously now I can apply Elmore's delay equation on this. For every capacitor, I multiply it with the resistance it sees between this and the source. This capacitor the same, and so on and so forth. And we do this n time, and we figure out what our time constant is. And then we let n go to infinity and see what's happening. Okay? So let's do that. And I write down my equation. So every element has uh, the, you actually, if you work it out quite nicely, you get segment 1, segment 2, segment 3, segment n. Right, for a segment n is going to see capacitance c, and it's going to have n segments in front of it. So it's going to see n times r. The stage before that is n minus 1 times r, n minus 2 times r, and the first one only sees 1 times r. Now we do some manipulation on those things, very good old-fashioned serious compression and serious compression. And what we find is that the delay of this wire is rc times n plus 1 over 2n. Okay? Now, if I take n going to infinity, what I get is my time constant is going to be equal to this drops out with this. You get a factor 2. So I actually end over up with capital RC over 2. Where capital R is the total resistance of the wire. It's small r times n, L. And capital C is the total capacitance of the wire. Now, does it strike you? that this is substantially different. If I would have used a length model, what would my time constant be? Capital R times capital C. This is actually, there's a factor two here. So actually the distributed wire is actually faster than what a length model should predict to you. So we can say that the delay of a wire approximately, if I want to say T wire, TP wire, the 59% point is going to be equal to 0 0.69 times RC over 2 is equal to approximately, if you really want to be correct, it's not, it's not zero to exactly 2, it is actually something like this. It's 0 0.38 times RC, sorry, the 2 is already there. Don't count it two times. So that's an important thing. From now on, when you see a long wire and you say, what's approximately the delay of this wire? Just use 0 0.38 times the, the capital R times the capital C. OK? That's important because this will give you much better uh, propagation delay analysis. Now, before I go further with wires, um, let me tell you a little bit more about Elmar. I'm not finished yet with it. Because so far we've been simplistic, right? I always assume that my Elmore delay is going to be a chain. RC, RC, RC. But what happens if I have branches? If I have a wire that goes like this, what's the delay between this point and this point? Okay? What's happening with the capacitance and the resistance of this? Is, is the delay between this point and this point going to be impacted by the capacitor that hangs off here? And you would expect so, right? Because you have current, let's say I have a resistivity here. This resistor also has to charge, basically draw the current that basically charges those capacitors as well. So you would expect that those 
capacitors that are off the main root or on the side branches are going to impact my propagation delay as well. So this is why if you really carefully read this definition here that I just gave you, this definition of the Elmore delay, and actually this definition is correct. It says for each capacitor, it doesn't say for only the capacitors on the pot of interest, it says for each capacitor in the whole network, what we're going to do is draw the pot of current between that cap to the input. Okay? And we multiply the C not by the overall R of that pot, but the pot that's shared between the input output pot and that side branch. Only the shared part counts. The ones that are not shared is not included. And then we add up again all those RC time constants. So let me show you an example. Go back to this example here. Suppose I want to figure out the delay between here and here. This is my input. This is my output. You see the path between input and output goes through node 1, node 3, and node i. OK? Node 2 and node 4 are not really on the main path. But still, they have a capacitor and a resistor to it. So let's figure out what my overall uh, delay, what is my Elmer time constant going to look like? Well, let's start with every capacitance and what we can do exactly what we said. The first ones are the easy ones. So capacitor C1, so we're going to say tau, is equal to C1 times what the resistor is between the, this and the input, it's R1. So that's easy. Let's pick up capacitor C3. Same thing, C3 is on the path between input and output, so we add C3 times R1 plus R3. So that's what you see between this node and the input. I see R1 plus R3. Same thing for node CI. You get CI plus RI plus R3 plus R1. So these are the easy ones. These are the ones that are on the main path. What's happening with the ones that are not on the main path? So let's look at C2. So we're going to add a factor here, C2. What resistor should I take into account here? What's the multiplier factor from a resistive perspective? Remember the definition? We look at the shared path between the input-output and the path between this node and the input. So what resistance is shared? R1. That's exactly right. So R2 doesn't count. We only take, see this path is shared between here and here. So R1 is shared between the two. For C4, what do we have there? R1 plus R3. That's correct. And we're done. So go over every capacitor and figure out how, what resistance to add to it. And it's only the resistance that's in the shared path between where the capacitor of interest here and the capacitance that basically is on the input-output path. And with this way, we can do very complex RC networks with branches and things like that. This works actually quite nicely. Very simple trick, but very useful. Um, same thing here, this example, you should be able to figure out in, in no time. Same example. So let's see, what do we have? C2, they're all the same here. What do we see? C2 times what? If you look at this capacitor, what do we get? R1 plus R2. The second one here is also C2. What do we get here? R1. And for C1, R1. Right, we're done. OK? So remember that, because it's a fairly uh, important trick we're going to use a number of times. So here's now, now we can do fun stuff. Suppose I have an inverter with a wire. And I typically going to, if it's a wire that's resistive, I always use kind of this combination of capacitor and resistor. And it drives another inverter, let's say, with load capacitance, input capacitance, CL. What's going to be the propagation delay between, let's say, this point and this point, the end of the wire? OK. Well, let's try to do that. 
So obviously, there's going to be some propagation laid TP. And the TP is, let's assume that this thing has drive resistance RD as the resistance of the driver. Okay? What's the delay of the inverter going to be here? Well, this inverter is going to see a, something like 0 0.69 times RD times the total load capacitance. Right? The total load capacitance I'm going to see here is CL plus L times R times C. Sorry, L times C. Sorry, no. So you have an inverter at the, has it with a certain drive resistance, and the load capacitance, the capacitance <laughs> it's going to drive is the total capacitance that hangs off it, which is the capacitance of the wire plus the load capacitance at the end of the wire. Okay? Then, uh, we're going to see a wire delay, which is going to be equal to 0 0.38 times R times C times L squared, or basically capital R, capital C of the wire. Okay? And then this one the final factor that we have to take into account, this resistor here, this load capacitance, CL, also is going to see, if you look at the Elmore delay from CL, it's going to see RD, which I already take into account, and the resistance of this distributed wire. So I'm going to get another factor, which is 0 0.69 times CL times R wire, this R wire, C wire. So you see now that your propagation delay has a number of lumped components in there, which is CL, and a number of distributed components. Okay, is that clear? This is important. Um, you will see some problems like that in the homework, and it's something I typically like to do in midterms or finals as well. So you take a combination of gates and wires and say, okay, let's try to figure out what the propagation delay of this thing is. So you can see there's a lumped component, and there's a distributed component connected to it. Okay? All right. Now, this could be painful, right? If this is now a very long wire, um, the delay of this thing can become quite dominant. Any suggestion of what I could do to make it faster? I'm not going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it next lecture, but you might already have a guess a little bit of what I would do. I suppose I have this very long wire, small inverter or driver, like a clock. You have a clock distribution, you have this uh, big clock driver, and you have this very long wire that spirals all over your chip. Obviously, this thing is going to have a lot of delay. Clock skew, remember clock skew? Bingo, right? So how could I go around changing the delay of that wire? What would you do? What are the things that I, as a designer, can do to reduce the delay of a wire? It's, um, remember, it's 0 0.38 times RC. That's the basic delay of that wire, where R is the total resistance, C is the total capacitance. What could I do? That's right. That's exactly right. So it sounds counterintuitive, right? I have a long wire, and I'm going to make it faster by putting stuff in between. I put inverters in between. That doesn't seem to be logical in the first instance. But remember, the delay of the wire, this RC is equal to RC times L squared, right? The capital R is R times L, small c, capital C is C times L. So it's a quadratic dependency of uh, the, uh, the delay is, qu is quadratic in the length of the wire. If I now break it to the segments, I'm going to get somewhat of a linearization. It's exactly the same thing we did when we did complex gates. So sometimes having multiple simple gates is going to be faster than one very complex gate. And uh, so we're going to come back to that, and we'll figure out what the optimal number is going to be uh, in terms of how long you have to make a delay of a wire versus a thing. But, but you will see it's very similar to the optimization we have done before. Okay? All right. Now, suppose now you want to do spice. Um, you run around Spectre or something like that, and now you have a, let's say, I do a chip, and I have long wires on there. How am I going to model these wires? Well, option number one is you buy a good version of SPICE, not a cheap version. 
The good versions of SPIES, uh, HSPIES and SPECTRE, all have what's called a distributed delay model or a distributed wire model. They have basically solved exactly these differential equations that I talked to you before. So it gives you an ideal, perfect response. Now suppose I cannot afford this. I only can get P spice. It's for free. You can download on the web somewhere. You know, you cannot expect too much for something that's for free, right? So what can I do with our long wire? Well, what you can do is kind of um, mimic it a bit. I can say, well, gee, what I'm going to do is take that long wire and split it up into chunks with R's and C's. And it turns out that you can get darn accurate without too much of an effort. Like the first model would be saying, well, I have my wire. It has capital C and R. The first model would be this, right? Okay. That's one. But that's not very good. Remember, it's a factor two wrong approximately. Right, there's a factor two in delay between my distributed wire and this RC. So the first trick already would be to say I'm going to put the capacitors into two pieces, and I put half here, half here, or like equivalently, I break the resistance in two pieces, and we put a capacitor in the middle. This, by no surprise, is called a T model. Right, you can see the T emerging right there. This is called the Pi model. Pi again merges as these two branches and so on. If you want to get more accurate, you do the pi 2 model. You break the resistor in two, and you basically divide the capacitor now into three chunks. C over 2, C over 4, C over 4, and vice versa. And you can go further to basically three elements in total, three resistor elements or three capacitor elements, pi 3 and T3. And the beauty of this thing is that this is within about 3% to 5% accuracy of what the ideal model would give you. So with only a small number of components, I actually can model these things quite nicely. OK? So you don't need to buy that very expensive version. P-SPICE will do the job for you if you know what you're doing. OK? All righty. That's resistance. We'll come back to it. Because resistance is important when I want to do long wires. Beginning of next lecture, we're going to talk about power distribution. We're going to talk about clock distribution. We're going to talk about driving huge capacitors over long wires. So uh, let's come back to that later uh, next lecture. But let's talk a little bit first about inductance. Um, I'm not going to say very much because at least in first instance, you're not going to meet, see inductance pop up very often, but you should be aware of this thing. Okay. So suppose I have a wire above a ground plane. I, I, I draw a circular wire here. In reality, it's going to be more like square. But um, you will see that uh, if I have a wire above a plane, we'll see a certain inductance basically appear. The wire cross section we see, see these wires have capacitance because they're both green, but they also have mutual inductance between them or a certain amount of inductors which means that if I have a current flowing to a wire, it might induce a voltage in a neighboring wire due to inductive effect. There's magnetic fields. Every time, basically, a current changes, we get a magnetic field happening. And microstrips are an example. In chips, very often, you will have uh, ground planes, planes, basically ground VDD planes and wires in between. This we call a strip line. Coaxial cables, you are all familiar with those. They have all certain values. So the more important thing to remember about the wire is it does not only have resistance per unit length, but it has also capacitance unit length, as we know, and it also has inductance per unit length. Okay? So another parameter we're basically introducing, the inductance per unit length. Now, um, let's... Uh, another place where inductors come in. So inductors in the wires on the chip basically play. There's other places where inductors come uh, and are very important. It's, let's say you might not have seen how chips are basically bonded, but typically the way you package a chip is you have a piece of silicon. That's my silicon chip. The way you put it in a package is you put it on a substrate, which might be ceramic, might be a typical insulating substrate. I uh, glue down there with some conductive glue. And then you have your bonding parts. Your bonding parts are basically the connectors on the side of the chip. 
Every chip is going to look like this. You have little square metal square thingies all around. And then they're going to basically use wire bonding to connect those metal bonding parts here to your pins of your package. If you still have pins, it might be ball grips, might be other things, there might be little balls of solder, whatever it is. But you have to basically bring these connectors out and connect them to the part of the package, where of the packet package which then is going to connect to your board. Now you can see these things are fairly long metal strips. Right? Uh, thick metal wires. This have a lot of inductance. This might have nano Henry's of inductance. And there's a couple of things you have to remember about inductance. Right? Um, there's one thing that says that V is equal to L times di dt. That's the basic equation. What it says is that if I have a current change in a wire, and the wire has some in sizable inductance, it's going to create a voltage in that wire. It tries to prevent the change in current. Right? It's always mm -hmm. trying to you change the you increase the current, the voltage is going to be such that it tries to prevent that exchange in current happening in the wire. Um, now, this can manifest itself in a number of points. Um, for instance, if I have this bonding wire here, bonding wires, for instance, suppose this is my ground connection or my VDD connection on my chip. So remember a chip of 100 watt, 100 watt, 1 volt, that's about 100 amps of current. That's a lot of current. Suppose now that in about two nanoseconds. In one nanoseconds, I basically ramp up from no current to, to 100 amps. One nanosecond here, 100 amps here. You get some inductors of one nano Henry. Work it out. You get a volt, a couple of volt. Actually, what you see is if you try to basically change a huge current very rapidly through an inductor, you're going to build a huge voltage over this. And as a result of that, my beautiful supply voltage on my chip, which I think is going to be nice and flat, is going to go bunk. It's going to be a large voltage over that inductor, and we're going to see, so you have your voltage here, and your current starts switching, you see your supply voltage go like that. And then since it's an LC network, it might resonate, and it's going to go like that. This is driving my inverters. If this is a volt, I have no volt left over my inverter anymore. It's not going to do very much. So the inductance of the package is already a very important thing. We're very worried about this. That's why you would take a big chip, say a microprocessor chip, how many pins do you have these days? Maybe 1,000 pins, approximately, going in and out. Of those 1,000 pins, there might be 300 to 400 pins that are nothing else than VDD and ground pins, just to make sure that you get all that current in there. You don't want to do it over one pin. You distribute it over a whole bunch of them just to make sure that your supply voltage stays kind of clean. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember about inductance. But let's look at my wire. So that's one part, but let's focus a little bit on the wire part. Suppose now that my wire doesn't have only R and C. Okay, so we started with a pure capacitance. Then we say, well, no, it's more like R and C. Actually, if you want to be realistic, this is a real wire on a chip. It has serious wire, serious resistance. It has capacitance. We knew that already. It also has serious inductance that build into it. The fact is that your current flows to that. It sits in a dielectric above a ground plane or above another wire or whatever it is. So we're going to have inductance. And by the way, your dielectric might not be perfect. It might leak a little bit. So you might have actually also some parallel resistance between the wire and ground. Now, I'm most of the time not going to worry about this guy here. The resistance, that leakage resistance. Typically, our dielectrics are good enough that we can ignore this. So I'm going to ignore that. Again, I can now start writing down Kirchhoff's current law and uh, Kirchhoff's equation in every one of those points of this network. You get a very nice set of differential equations. You get n going to infinity, and you end up with this equation. Remember the diffusion equation? Now we really have the wave equation. 
it says that the second derivative of v with respect to x, where x is the position on the wire, is equal to rc times the time derivative of the voltage and then plus lc times the second derivative of the voltage with time. Now, what this says is indeed, if you look at electromagnetics, 117 material, you will see that equation, that's basically the propagation equation of a propagation wave, electromagnetic wave. Uh, what's happening is you have electrical field going into magnetic field, magnetic field into electrical field. They go back and forth, and that's the way it propagates. Right? That's the way light propagates. That's the way radio waves propagate. That's the way they basically work. So this might happen on a chip as well. However, most of the time, we don't have to worry too much about this because if the inductance is small, this factor drops out, and we go back to our previous equation, we have the diffusion equation. But suppose now that I'm saying, well, I'm going to use a very good interconnect material. I'm going to use the best interconnect material, and I'm going to use thick wires. Okay, so resistivity drops out. What you're going to get is rho v squared rho x squared is equal to LC of the derivative of v with respect to t. Uh, the R factor drops out. We don't have this factor anymore. We just have LC in here. Okay. This is what we call the lossless wave equation. Because resistors basically cause a loss factor, right? They basically make sure that if I have a, a waveform and inject it, you have losses. But if I remove the loss factor, you basically get a pure electromagnetic wave propagation factor. Now, what do we know about electromagnetic waves? Uh, maybe not much, uh, but you might know certain things about it. You know how fast they go? What's the speed of an electromagnetic wave? Speed of light. Right. So this basically is, is, is creating a waveform. As I said, you start, suppose I have a pure, trans, we call this a transmission line. Okay? Transmission line consists of L, distributed L and C elements. Okay? If I apply a step at the input of this wire, it will propagate as a wave down the wire, and the speed of that wave propagation is going to be the speed of light. Now, light in air is an interesting thing to number, remember. It is the way it's something that good to keep in mind. If you have pure air as the dielectric, we'll see that the propagation speed is going to be 30 centimeters per nanosecond. It's an interesting thing to number. So if I have a board, like this is about 30 centimeters, my computer, it takes light to go one nanosecond for go from here to here. That's slow in a sense, right? If I basically start switching gates at picoseconds of gate delay, a nanosecond is about 1,000 of those delays. So it takes a while for light to go from one to the other side. Now that was the good news. The bad news is that actually this is not really true because it's in, in air. If I put it in silicon dioxide, for instance, as the interconnect material, a dielectric material, this drops to 15 centimeters per nanosecond. So it's half as fast. Okay. So important, right? If I now put a, a um, um, thick wire on a chip, and I'm using very good interconnect material, the speed of the propagation or the delay of that wire is purely set by the propagation speed of that waveform. You apply a step, and you can see this wave going from one side to the other one. With the capacitor, it's instantaneous, right? If I have pure capacitor, I apply my voltage, bingo, it's on the other side. With the resistance, it kind of diffuses. It goes like slowly diffuses to the other side. With a wave, it is really a wave that moves in. And if you're not careful, the wave might come back and go the other way again and the other way again. And that's exactly what might happen. So you have basically wave reflections happening. So some properties, speed of a wave. Now, interesting to observe is that the speed of a waveform is not a function of the material you're using for the interconnect material. Okay? It's only a function of the dielectric around it, of the permittivity, and basically the permeability of the material. Permittivity is mu. So the propagation delay is equal to C0, 
which is the speed of light in air, 30 centimeters per second, divided by the square root over epsilon r times mu r, which are your relative permittivities and permeabilities. So notice another interesting thing. It turns out that if I look into one of those transmission lines and I apply a waveform, I can say so I apply a voltage, I should be able to see a current, right? That's the impedance. Apply a voltage in here, you measure the current, you see an impedance. Now, this wire has no resistance. It's only inductance and capacitance. So you would expect that the impedance is going to be complex, right? Because uh, R is real, and inductance and capacitance are basically acting imaginary components. It turns out that that's not the case. The impedance that I'm seeing in one of those things is actually equal to the square root over L over C and looks like a real impedance, a resistance, with value Z0. And Z0 we call the characteristic impedance of a wire. For typical wires, this could be a variety of values. For instance, if I take coax, coax for you, suppose you do cable TV. Right? The guy from cable TV comes in, puts a wire from the, from the outside in the home to your TV set. It's going to be a wire that has a characteristic impedance of how much? Do you know? 75 ohm. Uh, it's printed on there. Uh, 75 ohm characteristic impedance. And it's, you measure it, actually. You can measure it. It's going to be 75 ohm. Um, if you used to, in the old days when they did interconnection for internet, you used to, nowadays it's all those uh, skinny wires that we're using. In the past, it used to be coax. Coax was 50 ohm. On chip, it's more like 100 to 500 ohm characteristic impedance that you will see, or on board. Okay. Now, why is it important? Well, um, wave propagation speeds, we talked about that. Now, why is it important? And I think I'm just going to give you a brief uh, introduction to this. Suppose I have a wire and um, with a characteristic impedance Z0. Okay. Now, I, I, I apply a step here at the input of that wire. Uh, that th the input. Remember, it takes a certain amount of time, which is equal to the, what's called the time of flight. It takes a while for that waveform to go from one side to the other side. So the time of flight is obviously equal to L over nu, where nu is the speed. Right? That's the time it's going to take from the waveform to go from one side to the other side. So let's call this TF. So I apply my waveform, and it goes happily to the end of the wire. Suppose now, at the end of the wire, I don't hang anything. It's an open circuit. What's going to happen is that I'm going to just reflect the complete waveform. The whole waveform comes in. It arrives there, and there's nothing. There's an infinite load impedance on the other side. What's going to happen is the whole thing is going to come back to the input source. Um, if I have a short circuit, so I apply a voltage here. Here I have a short circuit. They don't see each other. It takes a while before the end of the wire can communicate with each other. So they cannot say, hey, shout, hey, I'm grounded. You don't know. So you apply the waveform. The waveform goes to the end, and it reaches the end. It says, here's 0. I'm V. And now you have to communicate backwards to the beginning of the wire that this thing is grounded. So what's going to happen is the waveform that fell in is going to get reflected, but now with an 180 degree phase shift. So you get a waveform coming in like this, and the waveform that returns is going to be 180% in the other direction. So the sum of the two becomes zero, but it should be because it's grounded. And slowly but surely, the whole wire is going to get grounded. Okay? Now, the beautiful part, however, you can see now this, this game, right? I have a wire, and I apply an input signal, and the wave comes in, and it reaches the end, gets reflected, goes here. It's again not matched. It might reflect again in the other, right? Now you can see that a waveform might start doing things like that. Right? So it takes a long time. It could take a long time before my signal basically reaches steady state. Because it might reflect back and forth, back and forth, till everybody agrees that they're at the final value. That's not very nice from an overall propagation delay. Maybe I have to wait that long before I basically can start the next step. I have to wait for that waveform to die out. 
So what I would like to have is something that moves as fast as possible to the end of the wire and then says, I'm done. And the best way to do that is to terminate your um, transmission line with an impedance which is exactly equal to the characteristic impedance of that wire. Because in that case, waveform comes in and nothing gets reflected. It's done in one shot. Okay? So this is uh, what we call a perfectly, um, this is called the termination here of the, this is a perfectly terminated line. Single goes in, bingo, done, we're finished. And the delay of the wire is equal to the time of flight. While in this case, where you have reflections back and forth, it might make many, many, many times of flight before you basically are completely damped out, which is slow. So anytime I have a thick wire on a chip with good resistivity, the ones that the one on the top there, I better start thinking about termination. Because if I don't terminate it right, I might be having things washing back and forth of my ship a number of times. Um, this, for instance, example, this case here would be the typical case of termination. Because if you look at an inverter, suppose I take a wire and I put an inverter. The inverter has a capacitive load, purely capacitive, no resistors. It's pretty close to an open circuit. So by just, if you have a transmission line driving an inverter like this, you will see something back and forth a couple of times. So that's something you don't want to have happen if you really go very fast. Now this is not going to happen at 200 megahertz. This is when you start doing the 102 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz gaming type of thing. And it's something you really worry about. Um, I'll show you a little bit more tricks about how to analyze this. But let me just show you, just to terminate this, let me go back. This is, for instance, uh, already in 400 megahertz. This is in 1998. They measured on a chip using uh, uh, electron beams. They measured the waveforms of the clock at different points in the chip. And they clearly saw all those wiggles here, and overshoots and things like that. That was purely effect of reflective waveforms that they start seeing emerging. That's at 400 megahertz. If you go faster than that, it will become a lot more outspoken. And you really have to start thinking about dealing with transmission line effects. So what I'm going to do in the beginning of next lecture, I'm going to be trying to briefly discuss um, what we could do to uh, analyze the transmission line. Because I think it's important that you understand that a little bit. Not in depth. You have to do 117 for that. But at least some, some insight on how to play with some of those type of things. Because I can guarantee you, at some point in your career, you're going to run into this thing. So be aware of it. OK, so um, I'll send you a message uh, regarding the next lecture. I, I hope we can do it on Tuesday sometime. Um, and I also expect some information by Monday regarding the state of your project. OK? Have a good weekend.